Just say the word. 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 Hello, I'm Paul Mangel. I'm Balna Zhikseni. And I'm Yulia Stancheva. Welcome to Just Say the Word, a podcast in which we pay homage to our relationship with words, their meaning and their power to create our world. In every episode, we invite a special guest and ask them, what is your word? What does it mean to you? Where does it come from? As we immerse ourselves in the world of each guest, we will tell you the story of their chosen word and how it relates to their life's experiences, successes and achievements. Our guest uh, on this episode is James Fox, an English actor very well known for notable films in the 60s and 70s, including King Rat, The Servant, Thoroughly Modern Millie and Performance, and has been, uh, since then, an evangelical Christian, as well as appearing in a wide range of film and television productions. James Fox, welcome to Just Say the Word. Thank you very much. And now, in time on the tradition, it's time for you to just say the word. My word is translation. Very interesting in terms of language and uh, at the moment with so many things happening in the world, uh, a very useful word. But tell us, why have you chosen translation today? Let me tell you, I was filming in Russia in the 1980s and 1990s. And one of the things that frustrated me so much was that I, I really felt attracted to the Russian people and yet I couldn't communicate with them. And so when uh, my wife, Mary, and I wanted to, a hobby in, in our 60s, we chose ambitiously Russian. Okay. And, and, and it so happened that the linguistics professor from Moscow State University just arrived in the UK and started the Russian language experience in London. So it was a hobby that got me going. You know, I can translate Chekhov and Turgenev. I've mastered some of the grammar and and so if I spent some time in Russia, I'd probably be able to get by. But what, what this led to was that our, our teacher, Dmitry Antonov, introduced us to Dr. Zhivago by Boris Pasternak. And we both fell in love with the book. And basically, of course, Pasternak had to earn his living as a translator because in the Soviet period, he couldn't be published. Mm. And, and his great masterwork, which he began in 1947, Dr. Zhivago, he had completed by 1956, and they were only willing to sort of do it in excerpts and, and obviously control it because they thought it was anti-Soviet. And he always said that it wasn't anti-Soviet at all, but it described events between 1903 and 1928, yes. which covered the two revolutions and, um, and, and the Civil War. So that's how I really got into it. And translation, let's face it, as an actor it must be a, a very useful thing because you can probably see both sides of the equation, which is I am, I'm deriving meaning from uh, a text and I am translating it. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm also, and, and this is to do with going from one language to another, I'm also putting some of uh, what I perceive to be the cultural and social significance that I can see as an actor that I want to extract from that. You know, has your acting in and, and your skills in that area been able to inform how you look at translation? Do you know, I, I'd not thought of that, but I guess what you're saying is that we actors are in some ways translators. Yeah, when I think as well of a way in which Shakespeare, for example, uses the word translated, it's not mm -hmm. always to do with one language to another. It can be one, from one situation. The situation was translated or, or he or she was translated. So there mm -hmm. is that sense in, of change. In, indeed, that, that's interesting. Yeah. Are there other languages that, that you've got to know or, or, or that you like the sound of um, that um, have meant uh, something to you over, over your life? Yes, this is very interesting. I would say that, you know, broadly speaking, our whole culture and background it depends on uh, the translation of, of um, works from different languages mm. into our own. And so mm. I was poorly educated due to my own fault, probably. But I, I, I would say I had a smattering of German and French. But what I'm really interested about now in my later years is, of course, that Hebrew, Greek, yes, uh, Latin, German, Russian, all have contributed to our uh, civilization. Yes, and therefore, to my understanding, I, I would particularly mention 
Hebrew and Greek in terms of the Bible. Yes. Because we don't get we don't get the Bible and we get um, many translations of the Bible now and but we get them from their original tongues. Yes. I was going to ask you about that, actually. But I, I, I looked at a website and I found this fantastic um, tool, an app, which allowed you to put in any uh, phrase from, from uh, any uh, verse slash, slash, slash chapter from the Bible and have it brought up in 40 or so different Bibles, everything from the Amplified Version to the King James uh, Standard Versions. And each of those, of course, okay. brings a different yeah. message. Yeah. When you use language yourself and when mm. you have been you know in, in your on your evangelical side how have you changed your language how have you translated what you wanted to say according to your audience gosh that is a good question isn't it sort of churchy language and churchy uh words uh, which have kind of lost their meaning for for the modern audience largely uh, this is a great challenge for us as as believers yes to communicate, because after all, translation or interpretation is about meaning. It's about communication. It's about dialogue. Interestingly, the um, the statement which I quite like that we cannot reason without dialogue. It, it, it's quite interesting that the word reasoning is translated in the Greek, which you just mentioned, dialogismos. Mm. We need to be in a dialogue to arrive at meaning. And so my relation to these languages is is that I'm I'm trying to derive from them a better understanding of of what they mean. What did the original authors mean? Yes. So I haven't answered your question very well, but I, I'm trying to get at the idea of communication. Yeah, I think that is a perfectly good answer. Um, going back to to translation, I often think of the relationship between a text, the writer, the director, and the actor, and the relationship between you know, who is translating what to whom. When you uh, work, you know, are you trying to translate the meaning of the original work? Uh, or are you are you really trying to listen to what the director wants you to do and excluding the work? Well, you're a director, aren't you, Paul? <laughs> and I don't know if you act, but I know you direct, I know you write. My best experiences as an actor have been when I have sought to follow the direction of the director. Right. The director has mastered the text. Yes. The director is the interpreter of the text and it is in his or her hands. Yes. And then when you kind of delve yourself into um, experiences that you've had or, or, or people, real people mm. that you have met in order to say, well, this character, you know, looks, feels as though, uh, just like someone I, I met, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, mm. do you have a sense of translating your experiences? Or Interestingly, after I was 40, I became a character actor rather than a leading man. Yes. For me, it's always involved how would I play that person out through myself yeah. and the particular uh, experiences that I have. Yeah. So my translation has been very subjective. Yes. Have you ever come across uh, situations, have you been involved in, in any humorous or difficult translation uh, um, a situation where where a translation has has slightly gone wrong or you've misunderstood something in russian for example and, <laughs> and been been sent the wrong way down the motorway or got a cup of tea as opposed to a glass of vodka or uh, I, I wish i had notice of that question because i guess there must be it must have been times i'm and where i've made hilarious boo-boos yeah. uh but off the top i can't yeah. i can't give you an anecdote now paul but you know, mistakes and understanding. Gee, isn't that part of it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've I've been in places in you know where where labels on doors, you know, have have, have oh, you, know, yes. you know push and pull um, have been yeah you know, and both pu people are pushing in the same direction or pulling in the same yeah. direction, and uh, yeah, 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 you 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 can find them all over. Yeah, uh, we found a quote on the web, and it comes from a Polish poet and translator who says it's it's a guy called Ignacy Krasiski. Uh, translation is in fact an art, both estimable and very difficult, and therefore is not the labour and portion of common minds. Uh, it should be practised by those who are themselves capable of being actors. Yeah. So that puts 
actors slash translators on a pretty high footing. Um, yeah. When you've been involved in your Russian or, or any other kind of works, how intellectually uh, stretching have you found it? Well, I, I would like to refer you back again to Boris Pasternak, who, yeah. as I say, was a, a translator. It is said that if, if Shakespeare had written in Russian, he would have written in the same way he was translated by Pasternak. Pasternak was a great translator. He smuggled in his worldviews, and in the text, he never was subservient, apparently, to it completely. He, he understood the artist's creation. Here's the essence of translation. It is, you don't impose, but you, you translate your own experience yes. upon a text, and then that text lives because it comes through the translator via the original source. Yes. I mean, that's something that I think um, in, in many, many, many cultures, that um, many cultures is true, that there is for a particular writer in the source language, mm. a, a favoured or, or, or a translator that really becomes the voice of that writer in his or her culture. Yeah. And that that's exactly right, I think. Yeah. Where are you next going with translation and language? As a result of uh, you know falling in love with the book, I wrote a play, a play about Pasternak seeking to get his work translated, fantastic, into other languages, and which I called "When the Weather Clears." It took me seven years. It's been it's been read out loud in London with some actors. Um, the present times obviously are not very propitious for uh, anything like a Russian play. As we conclude the, the, the podcast, can you tell us when you moved away from, from, from acting um, for mm. a while, what was the motivation behind that? Spiritual, um, mental, physical, what, what were the reasons why you became a, a, an evangelical Christian at that time? The main reason was that I had what's called an adult conversion. Yes. Uh, I, I wasn't even a nominal Christian. Yes. But due to circumstances in my life in my late 20s, I became open, very much more open to spiritual things. And I, I put the Lord Jesus Christ as being the, the preeminent spiritual influence uh, of the world. I left acting for a while because it seemed to me uh, sufficiently worthwhile to invest in this um, new experience. I would call it a new life. Yes. That new life was going to be difficult to live out in the context that I was. Yes. And I was offered an opportunity to learn, uh, which after all is what disciple means, learner, Yes. Uh, in a context that was conducive to developing and growing and perhaps becoming more established, more stable mm. in this new faith, which after all is very counter-conventional, counter-cultural, certainly in terms of my background, yes. and required a certain amount of investment. And, and I feel God led me in that direction uh, for, a, for a number of years, yes. um, during which I got married and we had some our uh, first four children there. And of course, everything changed yes. as a result of that. Yes, yes. Well, it, absolutely fascinating, James. And thank you so much. I mean, we really have taken the word translation and used it in many, many, many different contexts. <laughs> a, a real journey through that word. And uh, thank you so much again. Thank you, Paul. Just say the word. Just say the word. As Paul and our guest, James Fox, agreed, Everything is translated as we communicate with each other. Not just language. Emotions, thoughts and ideas are constantly translated into words, images and actions. But where does the word translation come from? Conceptually and etymologically? That's a question for our language detective, Balner. The word translation comes from the Latin word translatio. Trans means across, and latio, which is the past participle of fere, means to carry or to bring. Thus, translatio is carrying across or bringing across a text from one language to another. The Latin roots of translation are shared by many European Roman languages, but there are subtle differences in meaning, like the French traduction, the Spanish traduction, and the Italian traduzione 
Terms for this word all come from the Latin transducere, where ducere means to lead. So what these Roman languages imply is the need to take the lead across language barriers rather than simply carrying meaning when translating. In my native language, Kazakh, translation is Audarma, which means to turn something over, and for me it makes absolute sense, because translation is a complete turnover, almost like magic or art. Although I am a linguist myself and speak a number of languages, I was never able to properly translate. When you have learned how to communicate in a language, people automatically assume that you can translate, which is not always true. Translation is an intense mental work which requires years of training. And my family members, who are linguists as well, agree with me. Just say the word! Just say the word! Many types of translation have an artistic element, because the task of the translator, essentially, is to paint a new picture from an original source or create a soundscape with words that are based on the target culture. Translation plays a variety of roles in the arts, in theater, in film, in literature, and within a musical context. Translation and music is a fascinating area to explore. Translation approaches depend not only on the genre, but on the audience expectations. How is music affected by lyric translation? And how does music influence the translation of the lyrics themselves? The expression of songs and their reception by the listener can differ from one language and one culture to another. For example, when translated into German, Edith Piaf's French songs go through interesting mood changes and become more formal. Translating a song's lyrics, which effectively is localizing it, is meant to make the song sound and feel as if it were composed in the target language. Wouldn't you agree? Have you watched the movie Lost in Translation? Although Sofia Coppola has described her film as a story about things being disconnected and looking for moments of connection, we all know what it means to be lost in translation, right? When something gets lost in translation, it can be because the joke doesn't map over onto the target culture, or you have simply used the wrong word while trying to translate something, and you have failed embarrassingly in doing so. I surely have a few funny stories to tell from my own experience. Don't even get me started. But let's keep exploring the notion of translation in movies. Have you ever thought about how movie titles are translated across the globe? Titles are the first thing the audience comes across when movies are released. So it's vital that translated movie titles convey the message in a faithful, yet catchy and creative way. But some have really gone over the board. Like Guy Ritchie's film Snatch, which was translated as Pig and Diamonds in Mexico. Or Steven Spielberg's Jaws, which became the feed from the sea in France. The eternal sunshine of the spotless mind was transformed to the power of feelings in Lithuania, whereas in Italy it was translated as If you love me, I will delete you. One of the funniest movie title translations, though, is Knocked Up, which turned out as One Night Big Belly in China. When it comes to books, translation is art on its own. Great books travel. They reach all corners of the world, and for that they need an artistic and creative translation, which resonates with the target audience. You cannot translate literally. Languages are entirely different systems. You can't impose, for example, Spanish on English or vice versa. Or as Edith Grossman, best known for her translations of works by Miguel de Cervantes and Gabriel García Márquez, says, translation is an oral practice. You have to be able to hear the language of the original. You have to be able to hear the tonalities, what the language indicates about the intelligence or class of the speaker. You have to be able to hear that, in her case, in Spanish. And then you have to be able to speak it in English. Shakespeare offers us an interesting perspective on the word translation, which he uses in very different ways to mean change. For example, in A Midsummer's Night Dream, 
Bottom's head is translated into an us, and Helena wishes to be translated into her best friend Hermia because of love for Demetrius. Since the 16th century, Shakespeare's plays and sonnets have been translated and performed all over the world in an ever-growing number of languages, dialects and styles. Yet, when Shakespeare plays with words such as bottom and us to show translations and transformations within the play, to express his wit and humor, it may be ever more difficult for translators to translate his work into foreign languages. There is an Italian saying, traduttore, traditore, or translator, traitor, says Royal Shakespeare Company Artistic Director Gregory Doran. Translation provides the opportunity to make the place more colloquial. But can Shakespeare's body jokes and tragic plotlines really work in another language? Translation and culture are intimately connected. Meanings in both source and target languages are profoundly affected by the cultural context. Deeply held taboos in one culture can be completely neutral in another culture. When President Carter went to Poland in 1977, the State Department hired a Russian interpreter who was not used to translating into Polish. Through that interpreter, Carter ended up saying things in Polish like when I abandoned the United States, instead of when I left the United States, and saying things like your lusts for the future, instead of your desires for the future. The mistakes became a media field day, much to the embarrassment of the president. One of the most well-known marketing campaigns of the 90s. Americans still have the got milk stuck in their heads. However, this is not the case for Latinos. The catchy got milk slogan was mistranslated into Spanish as are you lactating? Are you lactating? Sounds like a funny translation at first. But the connotation in Spanish implies that a mother cannot provide milk for her child. Not so funny anymore, is it? Thankfully, they nipped this lost in translation slogan in the butt. Instead, the California Milk Processing Board marketed to Latino households with the slogan Familia, Amor y Leche. Family, Love and Milk. Should this type of content retain some of its original words and phrases? Cultures that are not our own should at least remain their own. Do you agree with that? Let us know. This episode was produced by me, Yulia Stancheva, for Alpha CRC. My co-hosts are Paul Mangel and Balnor Jekseni. Sound design, Alpha Studios. Audio engineers, Mikos Nanasi and Gerard Rodriguez. With special thanks to our guest, James Fox. If you like this show, please rate, leave a review and subscribe so you never miss another episode. Thank you for listening. We will be back in two weeks' time. Just say the word. 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 This podcast was brought to you by Alpha CRC. Global Enterprise Localization. Local User Experience.